Hey guys, in this video today we're going to look at a new feature for Flow Enterprise 2.4 and it's called Subflows. And essentially what a subflow is, is just a way where you can create a flow within a flow. Um, and I'll talk about a few things about why it's so useful and some cool things you can do with it. So the first thing you'll need is to create an application. And so I have an app already built, so I'm just going to walk through what I did. But what, just like any other application that you build, you'll want to create the app, create a new flow. And in this case, my the primary flow is called main flow for me. If I look into here, this is just built off of the bookstore example I used in a previous video. So if you want to look at how I did that, um, check out the video with relation to app metrics. Um, so to start off, I have a trigger for HTTP message. Um, I have a log message um, activity. And then inputs and outputs, I have ISBN as the input setting and then code and the message with title, description, publish date as the output setting. So these are things that you could add in um, before you even create the subflow. But then you see this activity says start subflow. And when you first place this in, and let's say you have no other flows within your app, you'll notice that the select flow is blank. So in this case, because I already have another flow there and I've selected um, that flow as the subflow, um, it shows here. But if I didn't, or if I didn't have another flow, then this would just show us none. And so at this point, this is where you'd have to go back and create another new flow, and which would be your subflow. And so let's say I'm going to create a new flow, give it a name. So something very important to do and um, to keep in mind is that you must create the subflow with a blank flow, not a trigger. And so the reason why you have to do this is because within the subflow itself, you have to say what the input of the subflow is and the output of the subflow is without any type of connection or anything to a trigger. And you can only do that with a blank flow. If you do it with a trigger, then it'll create the trigger, but then the inputs and outputs of whatever's coming into the flow will be tied to that trigger itself. So you'd have to create, just make sure that you create a blank flow if you want to use, uh, if you want to use your flow as a subflow. So cancel. I'm already created one, so I'm going to open that up. And if you notice, this is what I'm talking about, the flow inputs and outputs. Um, so just like how you saw in the main flow, I have my input setting to ISBN string, output setting to code, message with title, publish date, description. If you started or you initialized this with a trigger, you wouldn't have the ability to set these settings. And so it's very important that, they, once again, that you use a blank flow as the starting uh, position for whatever you're building. So you'll notice within this flow itself, I just have the invoke REST service where I just call upon a Google API for books. And then I just query depending on whatever ISBN I enter um, within my main flow. After that, I return the value that's given to me and I break it apart into title, publish date, and description. And then when I go back to the main flow, if you notice that my return for the message there is just what the values that came out of that subflow are. So essentially is the subflow itself is just the rest the rest call. It's getting the values from the API. It basically separates them into title, description, publish date, and then it's gonna pass it along into the return variable in order to actually get that flow, um, get you what you wanted. And so a few other things about subflows. So the first thing is that you can't have, or you can't call upon a subflow that's sitting in a different app. So here's an example, is that if I had my main flow and then I had my subflow sitting in a different application, I wouldn't be able to call it. It has to all be within the same app or else it's just not going to show up when you try to uh, start it. So that's one thing. Second thing is that you can actually call a subflow within a subflow. So if let's say you have a subflow and you want to make a call with it to a subflow, um, you can do that. Just make sure that you don't have any type of um, recursion or circular de dependencies that may cause errors. And if you end up do having that, then Flogo, when you try to run it, will actually throw you an error telling you that you have a cyclical dependency. So just something to keep in mind of. Also, subflows are very helpful where if you need to iterate between an amount or an amount greater than one of activities. And so let me explain. Normally, for iteration in Flogo, you just click on the activity, go to the iterator tab, and then you can basically set your iterator function either being some sort of like for loop or some sort of count where you basically say how many times you want to run this activity uh, in a row or repeat before you move on. But the thing is, because the iterator function only works for a specific activity, so one activity at a time, then if let's say you needed to iterate five activities, that would mean having to set up work for or set up five different iterators, and you'd have to figure out how they all play with each other to make sure that um, everything is working correctly or any type of dependencies that were needed in a previous activity to get passed along correctly to the 
all the new activities and things like that. So what's neat about subflows is that if you just create, let's say, um, if, if my subflow here was five activities, and then I put an iterator on the main flow um, with the su start su uh, subflow, what happened is that it would iterate through those five activities in order every time the iteration happens within here. So let's say I had the iterator set where I wanted to run through this three times and I had five different activities. What it would do is run through the activity all five once. It would start from the beginning again, run it again, and then start again, run it the third time, and then it'd be done. So it's very helpful where if you need a, a set of activities that need to be run in an order in order to get a certain output to be run, over and over, this is the way to do it. You don't want to have to configure iterator, iterator values for every activity separately. This is the way in terms of ease of use and also in terms of functionality, um, how you'd want to go about it. Another thing is that because the subflows can be, um, because the subflows don't have a different class type to a main flow, um, it's very easy to build these and to choose exactly if you want to use them as subflows or not or if you want to import them or use them in multiple different other flows. So like when I showed you the create flow, if I test, if you notice there was no value here that shows me like a different class, so let me say create a blank flow, it just creates the flow like a flow, um, a normal flow, a main flow, whatever you want to call it. And that's because Flowgo doesn't have a notion of classes or any type of distinction between a subflow and a main flow. Um, they're all seen the same way within Flogo itself. So that's very helpful because let's say you want to build something out and you realize afterwards saying, oh, this should be a subflow. Well, you don't want to have to go back and create something new just because you chose the wrong class type or something like that. So you, in here, you don't have to worry about that. And then also, um, when you build subflows out, like I said earlier, you can actually use these in multiple other flows. So I have, let's say, I called upon my main flow. Let's say my test flow, I need to call upon it as well. Well, the nice thing about it is that instead of having to set up the logic for both of these, I just have to make the call and the logic's already all built in within the subflow. I just have to um, map the inputs and outputs. So yeah, um, to show you an example of how this looks, um, I already built the application, but once you built out your app with uh, main flow and subflow, let me delete this test one, you build it, um, choose the operating system, in this case Darwin, generate the binary and then you're actually going to uh, run it so in this case because it's HTTP app you have to it's just the HTTP trigger is waiting for some sort of input I'm um, on port 2933 or 9233 and so in this case I'm just gonna run on postman I'm gonna do a get call to a specific ISBN number in this case it returns to me the description published date and title and if you notice here I get the ISBN and then complete it successfully so if I look at how that's actually broken apart within the Flogo app itself, the main flow, the trigger, that's what's waiting for the ISBN number. So it's, until I enter that, nothing happens. Once the ISBN has been entered, the log message then maps um, what the ISBN value is. Then you get passed along to start a subflow. Um, and then this basically calls upon the subflow logic. And in this case, it was the REST service um, that did the API call to actually get you what the title description and the publish date are and that's passed back and returned into the main flow, um, as you see here. So in terms of this example, using subflows may not be ideal just because it's a relatively easy use case, relatively easy example. But in things that are more complex where you have a lot more activities that need to be either iterated by or to be reused by different flows within an application, it makes a great sense to use subflows in terms of ease of use, um, but also from a development point of view, um, just to make sure that everything's working and calling upon things properly. Nothing has changed or anything like that. So yeah, um, I hope this video was helpful. Um, check out the other videos in regard to Flogo Enterprise 2.4. There'll be some more videos that also come out. Um, yeah, thank you.